Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for episode 97 of the show. I'm your host, Louise H. Reed. Each week on the show, I invite you to sit in on a conversation with a new guest, someone who is an incredible example of taking brave, bold action in pursuit of their dreams and goals, and share their journey on the show to help you do the same in yours. My hope is that you walk away from the show inspired and equipped to level up in your own life and leadership. My amazing virtual assistant, Mel, has started capturing notes and quotes from each show. So if you want a copy of these each week, simply go to my website, subscribe to my email list, and each week I will send you the best notes and quotes from each weekly show. And today we have an amazing guest reappearing on the show who has got a whole bunch of awesomeness that he's gonna share with us around his new book and all sorts of other things too, but around his new book. So you definitely wanna get on that list so you can listen and know that the notes are coming your way shortly. Finally, remember that I love to give away exclusive Lady Boss loyalty swag as a way of say saying thank you to each of you for listening each and every week. Simply comment on a podcast episode with the hashtag Lady Boss loyalty and you will automatically be entered. So let me introduce you to today's guest. I'll share a little bit about Mike and we will hear from him in a moment. So Mike Robbins is the author of five books, including his brand new title, We're All in This Together, Creating a Team Culture of High Performance, Trust and Belonging. It comes out May 5th. For the past 20 years, Mike's been a sought after speaker and consultant who delivers keynotes and seminars for some of the top organizations in the world. His clients include Google, Wells Fargo, Microsoft, eBay, Harvard University, Gap, LinkedIn, and the Oakland A's, and many, many more. He and his hard work have been featured in the New York Times and the Harvard Business Review, as well as on NPR and ABC News. He's a regular contributor to Forbes, hosts his own weekly podcast, and his books have been translated into 15 different languages. Mike, welcome back to the show. Hey, Louise, thanks for having me back. It's good to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Me as well. So for those listeners who weren't uh, perhaps listening back episode 28, which is when you were on the show, this one's 97, right. yeah. um, tell us a little bit about your career up until now, because I want to jump into the book, but yeah. give, you, give us a little bit of context. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, but I guess we probably talked about this a couple years ago when I was on, but I you know, I, for the last 20 years, I've been doing the work that we're going to talk about in my book. But my early life, I grew up here in California, down in the States where I still live. And I was a baseball player all growing up. Um, I got actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Didn't end up signing a contract with the Yankees because I got an opportunity to play baseball in college at Stanford. So I went to Stanford and played there. Then I got drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals, another one of our pro baseball teams. And I signed a pro contract and the way it works in baseball is you sign a contract with a major league team, whether it's the Yankees or the Royals or the Blue Jays or any of the teams in the major leagues, right? You have to go into the minor leagues and try to work your way up. Unfortunately for me, I got injured when I was in, still in the minors. I was a pitcher. I hurt my arm my third season in professional baseball. And two years, three surgeries later, I was finally forced to retire from baseball when I was 25. But I had started at seven, Louise. So I basically played baseball for 18 of the first 25 years of my life and I was devastated, right? The injury and the end of my career was, was really hard personally, but I had become fascinated by two specific things when I was playing, particularly by the time I got to college and when I was playing professionally. The first thing I was fascinated by was I noticed that it wasn't always the most talented people that were the most successful and it wasn't always the most successful people that were the happiest or the most fulfilled. And I started to really question that and try to understand that. Wait a minute, well, how do you turn your talent into success? And if you have any success, how do you actually translate that into being happy and fulfilled? I'd never learned that. The other thing that I noticed, and this really relates to my new book and a lot of the work that I've done for the last 20 years, is that it wasn't always the teams that had the best players on them that were the best teams. Because I was on some teams sometimes where we had, you know, talent was good, team wasn't very good. Because like people didn't get along or there were a lot of egos or there was infighting or people were mad about whatever. And then I was on some other teams where, you know, the talent was decent, not great, but the team was fantastic. Like, cared about each other. We had fun together. We figured out, you know, and in sports, we call this chemistry. Mm -hmm. No one can quite define what the heck it is, but you know when you have it and you definitely know when you don't have it. And it's not just some warm, fuzzy, touchy, feely thing. It like makes the team play better. 
we would beat other teams that have better players than we did. I also always found it was more, it was easier for me to succeed when I was on a team with good chemistry than bad chemistry. So my baseball career ends. I'm super bummed. I moved back home to the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up. I get a job in the late 90s working for an internet company doing sales. I figure the business world, the tech world is going to be super different than the sports world. And it was, but I noticed the same things that I'd been fascinated by as an athlete. It wasn't the most successful people that, you know, the most talented people that were the most successful and it wasn't the most successful who were the most fulfilled. And that team thing was definitely that team chemistry thing in business. We just call it culture. It's the same thing. And I was like, Ooh, I'm interested in that. So after just a couple of years working for some tech companies in the late nineties, I started my consulting business 20 years ago, really with a curiosity on how can I, and how can we take whatever talent we have, turn it into success. If we have any success, actually have some fulfillment and collectively with our teams and groups, how do you create that kind of team chemistry, that kind of team culture that allows people to thrive. And that's really what, my new book, We're All in This Together, is all about, is the first time of all my books that I actually wrote a book specifically on what are the key elements that teams really need in order to thrive. And look, when I wrote this book, I knew it was going to come out this spring. It's actually, you know, you said May 5th, with the publisher actually moved it up a couple of weeks because I didn't expect it was going to come out in the midst of this global pandemic, of course. But what's been odd, but also um, really resonant, is that everyone seems to be using this phrase we're all in this together because now more than ever, we really are. Uh, so many paths we can go from there. <laughs> Thank you for that. The you know the 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 insight, and I know you talk about that in the beginning of your book. You have in your prior books, or well, certainly the last book that I read as well. Yeah. What you, you talked about it a little bit, but what what do have you learned since your last book came out, which is Bring Your Whole Self to Work? Right. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't. It came out in 2018. You and I talked right. about it here on your show. And, you know, that book had five principles in it. The fifth and final principle is called Create a Championship Team. And again, I've been talking about and researching team performance, team culture for years. And after I got done writing that book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, I just had this really strong sense that I need to write another book right away, for me right away, within two years. Um, you know, my wife, Michelle, my, our daughters, were, they were not on board with me writing another book because it's a process, right? The writing process, oh. it's, it's right, you know, it's, it's a whole thing uh, emotionally, practically, time-wise. And, um, but I just was like, I have to write this book. I have to write it now. I want to basically double click on the championship team thing and go even deeper into that. And I also felt like I wanted this book to come out specifically in 2020 knowing that here in the US we're in the midst of a presidential election, an incredibly divisive time in our country, in just about every country on the planet right now, there seems to be this intense level of divisiveness. And so while my, the book and my work isn't about, you know, politics per se or society, but it really like, I just keep getting the message more and more in so many different ways that we're really more alike than we are different. There's so much more common ground amongst us as human beings, even with all the differences that are important for us to acknowledge and understand as best we can. And so there was this sense for me that as I'm traveling around the US, around the world and talking to different people and seeing some of these differences play out, I also, over 20 years of working with all different types of people in different backgrounds, I know that what's necessary when, when we build strong relationships and when we create strong teams and groups and communities, not everyone looks the same or believes the same things or has the same opinions, but we have a sense of empathy and compassion, and understanding for each other, where we realize that we're more alike than different. And so that's a big piece. It's not that I didn't necessarily know that, but I feel like I've been learning that more deeply in the last few years. And for me, it was really important to put that in this book. And a lot of my research came back, especially the stuff around inclusion and belonging, that I just feel like it's important for us to be focusing on and talking about. And again, given the environment that we're now in, the irony of right now is that we're all separated because we have to be home to stay safe and stay away from other people. But we're also universally connected by this pandemic that none of us have ever experienced before. And it's quite, it's quite remarkable. Um, obviously, just not meaning to gloss over the tragedy of it, because clearly right. the, yeah. there, are no, there are no words for that. 
Um, but then on the flip side of that, because where there is tragedy, there is also opportunity and joy. I think um, totally. any extreme situation, you'll always see the polar opposite as well. And I think right. we're seeing a lot of that in behaviors and people, um, hoarding sure. versus kindness and all sorts right. of other sort of contrasting and very interesting um, situations that we're, that, we're, that we're observing. Absolutely. Um, well, and I heard Elizabeth Gilbert, who I love, who's the author yes. of Eat, Pray, Love and a bunch of other great books. I heard her say it this way that like, there's a, you know, significant number of people, obviously, who are significant, significantly impacted by um, this physically, like getting sick and the people who are dying. And, and to your point, we can't gloss over that. That's real. That's sad. That's intense. I mean, my heart breaks every day as I watch the news and I read more and I see the numbers and the, not just the numbers, but the people. There's a larger number of people who are currently and will continue to be impacted by this financially, as we're seeing the global economy and everything, you know, we don't know what it's all going to be when it all shakes out. But, and then what she said, and I agree with her that even more, probably just about all of us are being impacted by this emotionally. And so the question then becomes to your point is with the emotional impact of this experience that we're all having, obviously sitting in my office, in my house, talking to you and you sitting in yours and, you know, we're not sick right now. Thankfully, the people close to us, people close to me aren't sick. Um, you know, the economic impact, you know, my business has been impacted. I imagine yours and just about yeah. everyone else I know has been impacted to some degree, but all of us are impacted emotionally. And then the question becomes, how do we respond to that emotional impact, right? Do I allow it to take me over? Do I allow it to have me be bitter, scared of everyone, you know, hoarding things or whatever? I mean, and again, I find for myself, it's easier for me to manage this experience emotionally when I'm home. When I go out to the grocery store, even though I've only done it a handful of times, it's a very different emotional experience than I'm used to at the grocery store. It's like, oh my gosh. And not that, not only that, but just trying to interact, but not really interact with other people. I mean, I'm an extrovert by nature and I really love connecting with people and talking with people. And I find it so bizarre because I almost don't even want to look at people, Louise, as weird as that is, because yeah. I don't really know. I'm not someone who finds myself all that often socially awkward, but I feel socially awkward because I'm like, I'm not supposed to get too close. I don't want to touch people. I don't want to get close to people. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to, and I've got my mask on and my gloves on. And it's just like, it's rules just have changed. weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. The rules have changed. And um, I think to, to your point, when you were bringing, you know, we started talking about this as, as it relates to inclusion, I think what's neat, oh, and even why you decided to double click on that last chapter of your of your prior book, Bring Your Whole Self to Work, and that's what sort of birthed this, we're all in this together, um, is that the topic of inclusion has really evolved over time. So while yes. your interest, are, you know, it's all integrated, it's all connected, isn't it? Because right. while your interest in that has deepened as you have gone through life and through, um, you know, the, all of the 20 years in this industry, yep. we too are evolving as a society. Um, and this, 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 this area of diversity and inclusion and belonging um, is, is, is an area of focus that some people just put their whole entire career into. Absolutely. Well, I talk a little bit about this in the book. I mean, one of the things for me, you know, my background, so I grew up, as I was saying, you know, California, in the city of Oakland, California, super diverse city. Um, I'm white, I'm straight, I'm male, obviously, right? I'm, um, but you're at, the top was, of the you're at the top of the hierarchy. Right, yeah, I mean, it, racially speaking, all, uh, you know, gender yeah. wise, I'm at the top of the food chain with respect to here in North America, absolutely. Now, the interesting thing though, is I grew up raised by a single mom with an older sister, also going to school, public schools in Oakland, that incredibly racially diverse by the time I got to high school, even junior high school, it, being white was not the majority in the environments that I was in. Um, you know, as I talk about a little bit in the book, I was, I played in addition to playing baseball, I played basketball. I was the only white kid on our team in high school. I was the only white kid in the whole league. Every single other kid on our team and in our league was African-American. And you know, it wasn't that odd for me at that time because that was kind of the environment that I was in. Although there were so many things that I learned from that experience that I don't know that I fully understood and appreciated until I had some time and some distance and some perspective. Um, and when I went to college, I played baseball in college at Stanford, but I ended up getting my degree in American studies with a specialization in race and ethnicity. Um, just based on my interest and how I grew up and where I grew up and the things that were happening at the time, my senior year in high school, 
Um, there were the riots in Los Angeles after the verdict of the Rodney King case. Yeah. So there were things like that that were really pivotal. Now, fast forward to after my baseball career ends and I start my business 20 years ago, my first thought was like, I want to talk about and teach about diversity because I'm interested in these things. I know some stuff about this. I studied this in college. I have some unique experience. Even at that point, at 26 years old, I was, I know, realized, oh, I'm white, I'm straight, I'm male, right? I, get, I got understood more of being sort of in the majority in that perspective. But at the time, and even for many years, up until just the last few years, I thought to myself, I'm not sure anybody really wants to listen to a white straight guy talk about these things because A, what do I know? Or people will assume, what do I know? And B, I might unintentionally or even at times intentionally upset and offend people who have more lived experience, right? Does, does, do a group of women really want to hear a man talk about gender? Do a group of people of color really want to hear a white person talk about race? And I was like, I don't know how to thread that needle. I think I'm open and willing to talk about it, but I'm a little scared and uncomfortable and not sure. So I just sort of shied away from it. And for many years with a lot of respect and appreciation for people who are doing that work and have that lived experience, super important. I just decided like, that's not my thing. And in the last couple of years, what I've realized for myself personally, and I believe this to be true in a larger sense, is that if we're really gonna create environments of diversity and inclusion and ultimately belonging, everybody has to participate in that. And, hey, in, fact, men. and in fact, those of us, again, if, if we're gonna have more gender equity, men need to engage in that conversation as much or more than women do and really listen and learn, but also advocate for and be allies and sponsors of things. If we're going to have more racial equity and inclusion and diversity and understanding people who are white, who may not walk around thinking about their race nearly as much as people who are not white, particularly in certain environments, have to be willing to pay more attention, listen, learn, and be willing to at times say and do things, not intentionally, but oops, I said the wrong thing. Oops, someone thinks of me this way. And I've started to realize like part of the journey for me with understanding some of my own privilege is being able to use it in a way that I feel like is beneficial to other people. Not in some holier than thou way, yeah. but in a sense that like, what's the whole point of having any privilege is so that we can, if we choose to, use that privilege to benefit those around us. Um, and to me, again, like that's so important when we're talking about teamwork and culture, but I also just think it's a really important place with where we are in our society right now. And I think that really speaks to why, you know, 20 years ago, I think your sense was right, that people probably didn't want to be listening to a white guy right. talk about diversity and inclusion. We weren't there yet. Right. We weren't ready yet. As a, I don't think as a society, and now there's that recognition to echo what you said around we all have to be part of the solution, especially those in positions of privilege yeah. to speak out and, and invite others to the decision-making table, to the conversation. And so I love how you bring that up in your book. And I think that's why, um, because it is such a personal thing for you that, that goes back to your childhood, it's part of your own DNA, that comes through in the way that you write the book. And I really enjoyed that. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I think one of the other things for me, and again, um, I, I think there's a part of like, my work is always focused on at, at its core, um, authenticity, appreciation and, and my intention. And again, I, I try to, again, not to sound sort of holier than now about it, but to my intention always is if I'm going to get up on stage or if I'm going to get on a podcast or I'm going to write a book or an article or do anything, lead a workshop. And what the intention of it is, is like, let's talk about authenticity, bringing our whole selves to work. I got to first and foremost be willing to do that myself, separate from whatever I'm trying to teach. It's like, am I actually doing what Gandhi taught us, which is being the change, being the thing that, right? Now, and that's not to say that I don't have all my own issues and challenges and shortcomings and all of that, which we all do. But one of the things, especially with respect to diversity, inclusion, belonging, is that I think what's needed right now more than anything too, particularly for people who look like me, is an ability or willingness to model the messy, uncomfortable nature of those topics and those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of the reality is Brene Brown said something in her Netflix special that I thought was so important about this. She said, look, the mere fact, any of us who think, I don't wanna talk about those things because they're uncomfortable, that's the epitome of privilege, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't wanna deal with that. And that makes me feel funny or people think, judge me or think I'm weird. I'm not gonna do it. Understandable, I'm not judging that, but yeah. that's actually, again, it's like, well, I don't really want to think about gender because like, I don't have to because I'm a man. So you just deal with it. Let me know what you need. I'll see you later. 
right? Because in some way, it, it, and that's the point, is that if we can allow ourselves to step out of our comfort zone and pay attention to other people's experiences, you know, and that's the thing that it's simultaneously, here's one of the paradoxes of my book and my work is that I believe simultaneously that we are more alike than we're different. There's way more common ground for us as human beings than I think we often realize on the surface. And at the same time, we walk around it in the world in very different ways. And we can even look the same, be the same age, the same race, the same gender, the same orientation, like all, check all the boxes mm -hmm. and your life experience could be really different than my life experience. Your personality could be really different than my personality, the way you were raised, right? The stuff that freaks you out, the stuff that excites you is gonna be really different than mine. So it's like holding that paradox of all the incredible, beautiful diversity of us as human beings. And yet at the same time, the further down below the waterline on the iceberg, as I like to say, we get, we get to some pretty basic universal human experiences. And that's why like this pandemic right now, as, as scary as it is, as intense as it is, as real as it is in all these challenging ways, there's something universally humbling and vulnerable about this experience that no matter who I'm talking to right now, wherever they are in the world, whatever they do, whatever their family situation or professional situation is, there is this sense of like, wow, you know what? Life's uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. And the crazy part is that's true all the time. We just don't, <laughs> we just don't operate that way, right? It's true. Yeah, it's, the situation is one that, as you mentioned earlier, that we've never experienced before in our lifetime. Um, and it strips away all of the differences and really brings us to our core and to your point, being more similar than different. Yeah. I'd love to, you've jumped in, uh, you've mentioned a couple <laughs> of cool things that are in your book that I'm not ready to go into yet. One of them is the iceberg. And I do have that one okay. earmarked to ask you about, because that was that, and I can't remember the other exercise. It's earmarked somewhere that I wanted to ask you about, because I just thought it was really pivotal. pivotal. Um, but your book is organized into four key pillars. Can you just mm -hmm. briefly tell us what those things are? And then I'm, I've got some questions about, sure. about a few of them. Yeah, the pillar number one is to create psychological safety, which is basically group trust. We can talk more about that. The second pillar we were sort of already talking a bit about is to focus on inclusion and belonging. The third pillar is to embrace sweaty palm conversations. I had a mentor years ago say to me, Mike, you know what stands between you and the kind of relationships you really want to have with people? I said, what's that? He says, probably a 10 minute sweaty palm conversation you're too afraid to have, <laughs> which is very true. And then the fourth pillar is to care about and challenge each other. So it's the balance of both caring and challenging, not one at the exclusion of the other, but to really do both. And uh, that's fundamental for great leadership, but ultimately for great teams. And so tell us, for those who might not be familiar with the term psychological safety, um, what that is and why it's important. Well, again, it's, it's essentially group trust. It means trust is a one-to-one -one phenomenon. So you and I can have trust with each other or not in our relationship. And it's based on our experiences with each other, you know, lots of stuff that's happened. And we've all know what it's like to have trust and then not have trust with someone, but that's more of a relational one-on-one -on -one thing. Psychological safety is the group. How safe does the group feel? The dynamics of the group, the norms of the group, how we operate. You know, one example that I often use, I think about this in terms of um, just growing up playing sports and guys do this with each other in a way that guys make fun of each other or get sarcastic with each other. It's not that women don't do this, but there's this, ha ha, you're an idiot. You're stupid. Yeah, you're we don't. You're ugly. We do. Most of us don't. We not don't. in the no. same, not in the same way. No. But what happens is, so it's a way that men bond with each other, but what it does is it creates an environment that's not very psychologically safe because what it means is like, I learned as a young boy, don't admit when you're scared, don't show emotion unless it's like a little bit of anger or a little bit of passion, but otherwise like don't, don't cry. Definitely don't cry. Don't do anything that shows any weakness or vulnerability because that will get exploited and made fun of. Right mm -hmm. now, again, this isn't just a gender thing, but like in teams, in groups, if you think about this and, and right, right now with a lot of the teams and groups I'm working with, people are on zoom calls or Skype calls or right. Um, even before all of the pandemic, when you're sitting in a room with a group of people, do you feel safe enough to speak up? Do you feel safe enough to ask a question when you don't know something? Do you feel safe enough to disagree? Even if you're the only one in the room that disagrees, do you feel safe enough to take a risk, even though knowing I might fail and make a fool of myself? But again, if the group feels safe enough as a group, those things become possible. If it doesn't, it's not terrible, awful, evil. It just means like, oh, we're lacking some psychological safety. So it's more about the group itself as opposed to, and yeah, it has to do with the individuals, but you and I could trust each other a lot and still be on a team that doesn't have a lot of psychological safety. 
Does that make sense? There's layers, yeah, there's, layer, there's layers to that. Yeah. And so um, how do you go about starting? Is there one thing that you can give us a little bit of a teaser as to what you share in the book about how you start to create that? Because I know we are here talking for an hour, just right. less than an hour about right. all of this stuff. And really, you could double click on any one of these pillars, right? right. right? Maybe there's four more books in here. Maybe there's four more books. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. Well, <laughs> right, exactly. We'll have to talk to my wife about it. Um, I mean, I think, look, one of the things to first to do with any group that we're a part of is just to try to acknowledge for ourselves and ideally with the group, some sense of assessment of how psychologically safe are we, right? Just asking questions like, how safe does it feel on this team to speak up, to disagree, to, you know, make a mistake, to, to trust that it's not going to get held against us or we're not going to be shamed or ridiculed or judged for those things. So we take some sense. Again, this is also true, by, by the way, in families, in any group. And so some assessment without being harshly judgmental or critical. It's just like, where do we sit right now on the continuum of incredibly psychologically safe to not at all? Right. And the way you move the needle in the direction of more psychological safety is by operating with authenticity, right? Is a willingness to be honest with each other but also to remove self-righteousness, which is the I'm right, you're wrong. Like we, there are environments now online and other places where everyone's like spouting out their opinions, but it's not psychologically safe because it's like there's a lot of right, wrong, good, bad, us versus them stuff going on. Um, so that's where we got to be mindful of that self-righteousness. And then the thing we add to our honesty is vulnerability. This is what I call the authenticity equation, right? It's honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability that's authenticity. And when individuals within a group start operating with more genuine authenticity, the group becomes safer. And I love the way to, that you yeah. break the authenticity equation down and um, you went right into it. That was my very next question, <laughs> uh, which makes sense. So kind of going yeah. through the book in order. Right. The reason I like that is because authenticity, I feel certainly in the space that I work in, that we work in, I feel like yep. it's been thrown around a lot. Right. And authenticity is sort of the, is the core. You have, you've, you've peeled back those layers a little bit more to really reveal what authenticity is. So I really like that you bring that aspect to, yeah. to, to the book and you double clicked on, on authenticity. Yes. Well, how did, you come, how did you come to come to that? I mean, it totally makes sense, but we'll, we'll t tell us a little bit about that. It's, you know, so, I mean, I wrote my second book that I wrote that came out in 2009 is called be yourself. Everyone else has already taken. So I started really studying authenticity about 12 years ago. I had written my first book focus on the good stuff is about appreciation. And it's, it became sort of what I started to notice was, it, appreciation is super important. And I've been talking about and focused on that for years in my work. And if you're going to create an environment where people feel genuinely appreciated, there's also got to be space. Appreciation doesn't mean like, rah, rah, it's great. I love you. Everything's awesome all the time. It means I authentically express my appreciation. What's not necessarily the flip side of it is an ability for us to actually talk about what's real. It's kind of as we get into the fourth pillar, the sort of caring and challenging at the same time. So I started to realize like, oh, without authenticity, trust becomes difficult. Any kind of real connection, appreciation, if it's not real, doesn't really have any value. So, but when I started to look at authenticity, my thought about authenticity initially, and at the time, 12 years ago, people were starting to talk about it more. It's now become over the last decade or so. I mean, it's this buzzword. It's this thing. It's people talk about it and we all kind of know what it is. But when I started to ask people, what does it mean to be authentic? I heard different words and people oh, honest, direct, or, you know, transparent or open, but it's, start, I started to realize like, oh, there's more to it than just what's on the surface. Yes. It's about being honest, but I grew up in a home and I say this with love and respect to my late mother, but my mom was very honest, but my mom, like a lot of people was self-righteous. Like if you didn't agree with my mother, you were wrong. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And maybe part of it's also, she was a single mom. She had to kind of fend for herself. Like I appreciated the strength of it, but I realized like, oh, I learned how to like argue and debate from my mother. And then as I got out into life, I started to realize like this debating, arguing thing, even though I know how to win arguments and I'm a relatively smart guy who can use my words pretty well, like it wasn't really helping me in my relationships. Like people weren't appreciating my ability to win arguments with them. And I'm like, why is that? Oh, because I'm being so self-righteous. Like yeah. I'm right, you're wrong. And I was like, but how then do you have a strong opinion, a strong belief about something, express it, but not shut other people down and you're right. So that started having me start to realize like, oh, 
there's a way to be honest, but if you go all the way across the line of self-righteousness, people get defensive. It shuts them down. They, they don't want to engage anymore. And that's when I started to learn more about vulnerability. And I realized, oh, okay. So righteousness stops the conversation, gets in the way of the relationship, sort of cuts it down. Even if I win the argument, I've now sort of damaged the relationship. Vulnerability allows me, allows us to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. The natural response to self-righteousness is defense of this. The natural response to vulnerability is empathy. So if there's a way to have the courage to be honest, the self-awareness to remove the self-righteousness, and then the willingness to be vulnerable, all of those things combined get us to a real authentic place. But that takes a lot of courage, that takes a lot of self-awareness, and that takes a lot of willingness. And quite frankly, it's just easier for me to get on Twitter and call you an idiot. Like that's the world we live in, right? You're yeah. wrong, you're stupid. I'm gonna go over here with the people I agree with and I'm gonna tell you you're wrong or you're bad. Or in the corporate world or in the business world or even in our families, it's easier for us to sit around even on Zoom and go, ah, oh, great, that sounds wonderful. And then we get off the Zoom call or we get done with the meeting and we leave and I go, ah, Louise, that was ridiculous. I'm not doing what she said. I don't agree with that. But it was, I wasn't willing to actually say something about it in the moment because maybe there wasn't enough psychological safety or I didn't want that awkward moment of disagreeing with you and having you get upset. So I just pretended like I agreed. And so, you know, it's not easy. We use the word authenticity and think about it in this way. I don't know anyone who would say, oh, I'm completely inauthentic, right? I, I'm not, <laughs> authenticity is not important to me. I want to be someone who people know. But then actually being authentic is way harder than just saying we're going to be authentic. It is. And so thank you so much for digging into that a little bit for, for us. I wanted to ask because A, I was curious. <laughs> uh, and B, because I know these things don't come um, sometimes they come in a light bulb moment. They might come together in a light bulb moment, moment but they aren't elements that you just learn one day. It's a no. series of experiences. It's years of writing, of working with different companies around the world that you start to gain research, <laughs> that you start to gain awareness into these things. And so yeah. a very, very, very simple equation, hard to do, um, a lot of work gone into that, but the simplicity of it and power of it is just immeasurable when you when you choose to lean into it. And I, I, I just love it and see so much power in that. Well, I appreciate you saying, you know, one of the things that I think for any of us, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to us right now who, among other things they do in their lives, either specifically and practically like you and I do, or to be a teacher, to be someone who influences other people. Um, look, it's not easy. And I think we have to be careful because again, and all of us have a platform these days where we can then not just spout off our opinions, but let me share you my, my wisdom and my, right. I think it's important to, for all of us to pay attention to like, where are we getting information and wisdom from? Not that anyone's going to be perfect, but what's the source of it. But another thing that I've learned over the years of doing this work myself is that it often takes me a really, really long time to figure out something super complex for myself in a way that I think I can then communicate and articulate to people in a way that seems relatively simple on the surface. And I, I appreciate you, the acknowledgement of that, but like, that's actually not all that easy to do. Mm -hmm. And it's super important. And we live in an incredibly complex world and there's so much going on. And like right now we're in the midst of so much chaos, but any of us who have the ability to offer thoughts or ideas or suggestions to people that are easy to access but can unlock some pretty compl complicated things in a relatively simple way. Like that's a real service that we can provide for people. I totally agree with you. And that I think is the simple explanation as to why writing a book is difficult. <laughs> exactly. Right. Puts quite simply, cause there's all there's layers to that, but right. it isn't just that it's not just words on a page. It's, right. it's creating the simplicity and they're actually living it. And sometimes I know I've experienced that through writing my own very first book and my manuscript has just been submitted. So I'm still, Congrats. I feel like a success already, to be honest. I feel like I've just birthed a new it's baby. A um, well, and, <laughs> and look, and I'll, for what it's worth, having now done it five times, which I still, by the way, blows my mind. Like I, I always hated writing. <laughs> I don't writing. even know how you've done that. Well, but in, it, but again, and I, look, I, we have two children. I didn't give birth to either of them myself, obviously. <laughs> But, but, but there is a, there is, it's obviously different in so many ways, but I think the first one, just like the first baby is just uh, really hard, really scary, really confusing. Like you just don't know, you've never skied down the hill before. Right. I think doing it multiple times now, there's a part of it kind of like having babies. That's like, it's both 
really hard and painful and uncomfortable and confusing. And, and it's really extraordinary too, that has had me continue to want to do it because I'm interested in having this conversation with you and everybody listening more so than I am just simply managing my own level of comfort. Um, and that's been part of my own growth journey. You know, when I was, I mean, the funny thing is I was just reflecting on this the other day um, about my new book in the sense that if you had told me even in college or when I graduated from college, I granted I was still playing baseball, that I was going to write a book, let alone five books, I would have laughed out loud. You might as well said, you're going to be an astronaut or you're going to be a brain surgeon or something like you're going to go and be in the circus. I mean, something like completely <laughs> insane. I would have been like, okay. But, but what I realized, Louise, and this I think relates to a lot of people who listen to your show, is that there was this deeper yearning in me, this deeper calling in me. I used to wander into bookstores um, when I was going in my early 20s. I was going through some really difficult times mentally, emotionally, and I was drawn to the self-help section of books, of bookstores. And I, did, I wasn't a big reader. I didn't like to read. I learned how to read late as a kid. It wasn't my favorite thing to do. I'd rather be playing outside than reading a book but I kept, I'd wander into these bookstores and I both wanted to buy these. And I bought a bunch of books, some of which I read, some of which I never even read, but I was just like, I need help. I need wisdom. I need insight. I don't know where. To, and, and I was moved and inspired, but I also had this other voice in my head that kept saying to me, you're supposed to do this. And I'm like, I'm supposed to do what? This, like this, like who, you know, who, first of all, who's yeah. talking to me? And second of all, how am I supposed <laughs> to do this? And so I, I say that because I do think sometimes when our vision of whatever it is, is big enough, even if it scares us and we don't know how to do it, it starts to pull us in that direction and it kind of just forces us through. So again, like my commitment and my vision and my passion for this work is more important to me than not, more, you know, even when I have to no negotiate it with my family and figure out the time and go away to write and do all that stuff. It's like, I'm more committed to the outcome of this than I am to managing the process. Yeah, what a great, a great story and something to your point that I think many can relate to. And if you are listening and stuck in that phase, know that that is normal, that discomfort is normal as well. And totally, um, you're, there's nothing wrong. In fact, just keep going. Totally. And look, most of us in life, if you listen to most successful people in any genre, I, I remember <laughs> seeing one of the co-founders of Twitter, I saw speak at a conference a bunch of years ago, and he told this great story about how Twitter started. He and the other two co-founders we're trying to start something and it wasn't going well. And they literally got in this huge fight with each other, the three of them. And they were screaming at each other. And they finally were like, we need a break. And they took like a couple of weeks off that they didn't talk to each other. Oh. And in that break is when the idea for this little, what they were calling a mini blogging site that didn't even make sense. And people thought was stupid and insane. Right. And they came back together and they started to brainstorm this idea. And what birthed out of it was Twitter. And then he proceeded to then say for the next, however long it took, year or two as they were trying to get it off the ground up until the point when it finally really hit and took off they all thought it kind of sucked and didn't think anything was going to happen do you know what i mean and what he was basically saying was like look even when things turn out really well there's a whole process that goes on in in the journey of creating it that mostly again any of us who've created anything whether it's a relationship or a book or a business or anything else the doubt, the fear, the stuckness, that this is the worst, stupidest thing I've ever done, all of that stuff. The hardest part of doing most things, writing a book or anything else, is dealing with ourselves. It's not doing the thing. The hardest part right now of the pandemic, for those of us that are fortunate enough not to be sick and not to be in the hospital or not to be on the front lines of caring for people, the hardest part of this for me and most people I'm talking to is dealing with the uncertainty. When's this gonna end? How's it gonna be? What's gonna happen to the economy? How's it gonna impact my business? All of that. When do I get to see my friends? When do I get to hug people? When do I get to go to a sporting event? You know, all of that is the part that's really hard. The day to day, yeah, it's a little weird, but like I'm sitting here in my office, I'm having a conversation with you. I'm with my family, like I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Most of us are fine. It's just when we get into our brains and we start catastrophizing about what's coming, that's when it gets hard. Oh yeah, our biggest barrier and our biggest cheerleaders between our ears, for sure. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. So, um, Pillar number two is around fo uh, around focusing on inclusion and belonging. Tell us right. a little bit about a little bit more uh, right. about that pillar. Well, we talked a bit about it from the diversity standpoint, from the inclusion standpoint. One of the things that I found when I was researching this that was really eye opening to me, and again, I, it's kind of like the paradox of how we're talking about the pandemic. I don't want to minimize by any stretch of the imagination the challenge and the like 
hill we still have to climb with respect to diversity. And anybody listening, again, especially if you're not white, straight, male mm -hmm. like me, you know better than I do what that experience is like. You know, Louise, better, way better than I do what it's like to walk around in the world as a woman. It doesn't mean you can't be successful. It doesn't mean you don't have opportunity. It doesn't mean any of that. But it, I know from talking to enough women, <laughs> there, are a, there are lots of challenges that exist for women that just don't exist for men. That said, when I started to really dig into this and I was focused more on inclusion, diversity being representation of you know, many, many different people as much, inclusion being more about, okay, let's include everybody. What someone said to me in this really simple but profound way is when we focus on inclusion, as important as it is, we're basically still reinforcing that there's an in-group and then there's a whole bunch of out-groups and that the in-group can do a better job, which I totally agree with, and it's part of what I was saying earlier, to include the people who might feel excluded as much as possible. And while that's important, ultimately where we want to get to, if we're really going to create a strong culture within a team, group, any type of environment, is where people really feel like they belong. So there's no in-group and out-group. There's just a bunch of people who belong to each other. And when I started to look at that more, I realized, oh, belonging it's a fundamental human need, right? You look at Maslow's hierarchy, yep. it goes physiological, safety, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. Those are the five needs that Maslow taught us in his hierarchy of needs. Everyone needs to feel like they belong, whether they're male or female, whatever their age is, whatever their race is, whatever their background is. And look, clearly there are some people who've had more experience in life of feeling like they don't belong based on those factors and others, but all of us know what it feels like to belong and all of us know what it feels like to not belong. So everyone's actually qualified and empowered to engage in a conversation, not just a conversation, but in focusing on belonging because it's necessary and we all need it. And we all know what it feels like on both sides of that equation. Because one of the things that does happen, and I see this happen for a lot of well-intentioned, and I'm not, this is, I'm not trying to be the white straight man apologist here, but when I talk to other people like me, I will hear people say very earnestly, especially in the last couple of years, look, Mike, I wanna do something. I wanna say something. I wanna be an ally. I just don't know how. I'm scared. I say this and people think I'm sexist. I say this and people think I'm racist. I, I'm, I don't pay attention to that. And people tell me I'm this, I'm that. I'm, and I don't, like, how do I include myself in a conversation around inclusion if I am not someone who feels like I need to be included because I'm already included? Do you know what I mean? So it's com right. complicated. But if I say, hold on, let's flip it and talk about belonging. Have you ever had an experience in your life where you didn't feel like you belonged? Yes. Okay. What was that like for you? Now, all of a sudden, we get into a more real conversation of their own experience of not belonging have you felt like you belonged before? Yeah, what was that like? Why did you feel like you belonged? Okay, now we're, we change the access point at which we're looking at it. Now everybody is sort of required at some level to make sure everyone else feels like they belong, not from an in-out perspective, but just from a more harmonious perspective, if you will. Yeah, and, well, it sounds like everyone is gaining access through the same way. Yeah. Right. And again, and understanding privilege that we don't start at the same place. Look, one of the stories that I share in the book that I found that I thought was so poignant, a high school teacher wrote this and shared it online and I put it in the book, the way he teaches about privilege in his high school class. He said, what I do is I, all the kids are sitting in their desks in rows and I hand out pieces of paper, blank piece of paper. And I say, everybody crumple up your piece of paper. And what I'm going to, what he does, he said, I put a garbage can in the front of the classroom. I say, this can represents making it, you know, success, riches, whatever, you know, you made it. So sitting in your desk, I want you to take the paper ball and throw it into the can. If you make it, you made it. If you miss, sorry, you didn't make it. <laughs> and immediately what happens is the kids in the back of the class start complaining. Wait a second, hold on. This isn't fair. I have to shoot it from way back here. And those kids up front are shooting, right? And then he stops everyone. He says, okay, hold on. I'm just, he stops the conversation and he points out, look, this is not easy for anybody. Even the kids in the front row still have to throw their little paper ball like 10 feet to get it in the can. So it's not a slam dunk. Everyone has an opportunity, just some people's shot is easier than other people's shot in the class. And yeah. he said, do you notice, by the way, the people complaining the most are the ones furthest back because they have the hardest shot. And then he says, I end the lesson by explaining to everyone that education is a privilege that not everybody has. And so it's up to you to use this privilege in the best way you can to give opportunity to other people. And when I read that, I thought, oh, you know, this takes it out of the political realm. This takes it out of the racial realm. This takes it out of all the things that people get triggered by these days. Mm -hmm. We use the word privilege and it almost sounds like a slur or like a indictment of who you are. Like somehow, I think one of the challenges we have in our culture right now is not understanding that we can simultaneously have privilege. Like I have a lot of privilege and we could have also worked really hard 
to create some success in our life. Yes. Both of those things can be true at the same time. I know that's true for me, but I also know if I were female or if I were black or if I had a disability or if I had a bunch of different things, if I were gay, it's not that I couldn't still be me. It's not that I couldn't still be as successful or even more successful than I am. That's totally possible. My life story and my journey to get to where I am right now would be very different if I were a different gender or a different race or a different sexual orientation. It just would be. And to not acknowledge that is to just not to not acknowledge the reality of the world in which we live. And the but, that doesn't, but that doesn't diminish. I don't take that as a slight to me or somehow, yeah. oh, you don't deserve what you have or, oh, it's so easy for you because not that I have to prove that it's not, but like I've been with myself every day for the last 46 <laughs> years and I know it hasn't been like a walk in the park. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I love that when you can remove the, uh, what a great example that you that you just shared now and that you mentioned you put in the book, a great example of taking the emotional um, content out of the, 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 the discussion from the, right, right from the beginning. Right. Well, and I think on that front, one thing I will say too about my own life experience for what it's worth, and I only know what I know from what I've seen, I do think that growing up where I grew up and how I grew up in a way... I was dealing with an understanding racial dynamics from a very young age mm. that it's not that I never get defensive. It's not that I never get offended by stuff. I do. But like when, when I hear people talking about like, and I grew up in a house where my mom was very angry with my father and angry with men in general, understandably. Right. But like, I don't get super defensive when I hear women expressing their anger about men because I know some, I mean, I just pay attention to the world. And it's like, if I were female, and I walk through the world in a female body up to this point, I would probably have a number of experiences that would have me be angry with men in certain ways. And so I have compassion and empathy for that, not defensiveness, because I don't feel like it, I, I think, again, we can all, we can take collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. I've written a couple of posts over the last few years, like really challenging men, like men, we have to do better. This is not okay. Collectively, what are we doing? How are we not modeling for our sons and our brothers and our young men that like, this is how men operate. This is right. That said, I think there's a way to listen to that and not have to self-identify, if that yes. makes sense, right? That, oh, that's like, it's, it's an attack on me. If you're saying I'm angry with men in general, I might you know, point out that not every man is the same, but that's true for not every woman is the same, but it doesn't have to all of a sudden, then I have to go into some defensive crouch that now I have to go defend men. I can listen to like, where's the pain coming from or why is the anger there? And that's part of where we can all support each other. I think you said a really important word there that I, I don't think many of us do very well, and that's listen. Yeah. Um, and we have talked about two of the four pillars. We're <laughs> approaching the top of the hour. Two that we didn't get a chance to talk about: embrace sweaty palm conversations. Yes. And uh, care about and challenge each other, my uh, wonderful listeners. You're going to have to grab a copy of my book. <laughs> I'm um, not very. I'm not very short-winded, as everyone's now learning. If they didn't already learn that about no. me. No. <laughs> well, this is, but I kept it going. I think yeah. this is what's what this is what I love about uh, about you, what you bring to the show, which is why I was thrilled when you wanted to come back on and said yes to coming on. Um, and I think it just gives a richness to understanding the person who wrote the book. Mm. And yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you know, would, I can touch on this briefly, though. I mean, the sweaty palm conversation one I mentioned earlier about what my mentor said to me. Mm -hmm. the, the crux of that is really about being willing to both give and receive feedback and to engage in conflict in a healthy way. And neither of those things are usually all that comfortable for any of us. <laughs> However, if we're unwilling to give or receive feedback or we're unwilling to engage in conflict, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to build trust, for us to have that psychological safety we were talking about earlier, for us to ultimately grow in the way that we need to. I, I imagine every single person listening has had someone in their life or many people in their life, give them some hard feedback that they didn't necessarily love hearing, but they needed to hear. And we're, I'm always so grateful. I, I can think back to moments in my life when someone said something that I needed to hear in those moments. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't like hearing it, but I'm so glad they said it. Because there's nothing worse than like, even on a superficial level, have you ever had that where you walk around all day and then someone later in the day says, you got a little mustard on the side of your face. You got something in your teeth and you're like, that was from breakfast or whatever it was. And you realize no one said anything all day. And I've been walking around like this and that's kind of just a superficial thing, but it's like, if no one cares about us enough to actually point it out and that relates to caring about and challenging. I interviewed one of my old baseball coaches on my podcast about six months ago. And he said this great thing, at least to me that really epitomizes not only that, 
pillar, but like a lot of my work in this book, he said, Mike, my philosophy, he coached at Stanford for 37 years. He's retired, had a ton of success. He's a friend, he's a mentor. He said, Mike, my philosophy for coaching was this all those years. I got to love them hard so I can push them hard. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I knew that if I was going to get the most out of you or all your teammates and everyone I ever coached, the first thing I had to do was I had to prove to you that I cared about you as a person. And if you believed that, and, and I could convey that, that I cared about you, I loved you, I valued you, then you would give me permission to push you really hard. But if I didn't establish that I cared, I wasn't allowed to push you. You wouldn't let me. And he's like, I think that's how most people are wired. And I said to him, I agree 100%. And that's what I see all the time. When we care about people and they know that we care about them and we create an environment where people know you're valued, you're cared about, you're appreciated, then we implicitly or even explicitly give them permission. You can push me to the absolute edge of my limit and past <laughs> and I will listen to you and I will take it. I may not always agree with it or like it, but, and that's what great teams do for each other. I love that. I think it's a great way to, to put an exclamation point on our, on our time together. Mike, a huge, huge amount of gratitude for what you do, for spending this time with me and sharing your awesomeness with my listeners. How can people find out more about you, get their hands on the book? Just tell us exactly where we should be directing them. Great. Well, thanks for having me again. And thanks for asking that. The book's actually out now, as I was saying, our publisher put it out early. So um, people can just go to mike-robbins.com forward slash together. That's the special page we set up on our site where you can learn about the book. And there's even some free bonus material you get when you go there and, and order the book on that page. Awesome. Awesome. Again, Mike, uh, thank you. And I, and I look forward to, to seeing the great success that comes from this, your fifth book. And of course, what books come next? Because <laughs> there, there will be more. <laughs> I'm sure. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. And of course, thanks to all of you as well, my loyal listeners, and remind you that information about my show and my guests can be found at www.louisehreed.com. Also, a big shout out, as always, to two men in my life. This show would not happen without Cameron Steele at Contact Talk Radio Network. And of course, my better half, or my, I, actually, no, my other half, uh, Jay <laughs> <you> Andrews. <laughs> if you've been inspired by today's guest and are ready to level up in your own life and leadership, please contact me through my website and let's get growing. Until next week at 11 a.m. where there'll be a new show dropped, I'm Louise H. Reed, wishing all of you a bold and courageous day. Goodbye, my friends. <laughs>